We will be continuing with the series of the sermons on the sacraments. And so we'll do a quick review from last time. All the sacraments are a source of sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the single most important thing in this world and in the next. Sanctifying grace is absolutely necessary for salvation. Because without it, we cannot get into heaven or let alone live there. There was a man named John Eric Hexham. He was a movie actor on the TV show Voyagers. Now, on October 12, 1984, after a long and draining day shooting on the set of the movie Cover Up, John Eric was bored and began playing around with a prop on the set. Now, this prop was a 44 Magnum revolver with blanks in it. Now, he thought he would entertain the crowd there and have a little fun. So while he was joking around with them, he put the gun to his head, pretending that he was going to kill himself. After all, he was just shooting blanks, right? He pulled the trigger, and the wadding from the blank cartridge shattered his skull and killed him. Now, this was big news back in the 80s. It was a shock to many because he was a very popular actor at the time. But even more sobering was the fact that there are some things that cannot be played around with. A weapon is a tool like any other tool. And this is one of those things that people always have to respect because there is a serious power given to it because of the nature of what it is. The problem is not in the weapon, but in the lack of responsibility and seriousness in the people using it. Now, God gave to man and woman the physical power to cooperate in the creation of human life. This isn't a joke or a game or some recreational activity. It is a power that has to be taken very seriously because of its consequences. It's not just a prop on a set that is used just for fun. There is a tremendous responsibility that goes with this power to cooperate with God in creating human life. To procreate is serious. This responsibility lies in the fact that a new human being may be the result of a man and a woman using this creative power. This is serious business. It is so serious that God created a divine institution, one of the seven sacraments, to safeguard and to protect this power. Many today abuse this power outside of how God intended it, sort of like that Hollywood mentality of goofing around with something that has serious consequences. And this abuse will lead only to the death of their soul. Marriage is not given to us by man. It is given to us by God. And so marriage is subject to God's laws, not man's opinions or even the opinions of the spouses themselves. Pope Pius XI, in his encyclical Casti Canubi, which is on Christian marriage, says the following. Let this remain as as an unchangeable and an inviolable fundamental doctrine. Marriage was not instituted by man, but by God. Not by man, but by the very author of nature, God. These laws cannot be subject to any decision of man or to any contrary agreement on the part of the spouses themselves. This is the doctrine of the Holy Scripture. This is the continual and unanimous tradition of the universal church. This is the solemn definition of the sacred council of Trent. And these are the words of Pope Pius XI. So if marriage is a serious institution created by God that no one can change in any way, then what exactly is this? When a man and a woman enter into marriage, this institute created by God, they are entering into a contract. Frank Sheed tells us that marriage is a contract that results in a relationship. It is a relationship consisting of one man and one woman that will last for the rest of their lives. It is a contract which is the free choice of both the man and the woman. Now, what is in this contract that makes it so serious? The traditional description of the marriage contract is as follows. It is the mutual consent exteriorly manifested whereby a man and a woman give and accept an exclusive and perpetual right for acts which are of themselves suitable for the generation of children. 
the mutual con- consent externally manifested whereby a man and a woman give and accept an exclusive and perpetual right which are of themselves suitable for the generation of children. This contract, sworn before God, establishes the right to the marital act. Honoring this right is a serious obligation both in justice and in charity. So any reasonable request has to be honored and it cannot be refused without serious sin. It cannot be refused without serious sin. When the marital debt is rendered, it has to be rendered generously or it is not truly honored. Only for serious matters can the debt be refused. This is the primary purpose of marriage, and that is procreation and the education of children, with the special goal of ensuring that the children live and die with sanctifying grace. Now, the secondary purpose of marriage involves two parts, and that is the mutual help and comfort and also the remedy of concupiscence. First, mutual help and comfort. Not only to help each other in the household chores throughout the day, but also in the cooperation and training and disciplining of the children. It is also a spiritual aspect, and that is to get each other to heaven. The second is a remedy for concupiscence. The institution of marriage gives a legitimate use to the quieting of the passions. Since original sin, our passions are out of control. St. Paul tells us that the flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit wars against the flesh. So we have to get our passions under control if we want to be in the state of sanctifying grace so that we can get into heaven, and the sacrament of marriage provides this ability to the couple. In this is also the expression of love that intensifies the the union of these two different personalities. Many make this last purpose the primary purpose. So they believe that the whole purpose of marriage is to indulge in the passions and at the expense of not having any children. And this is an abomination to the sacrament and to the creative power of God. Here again we see the Hollywood mentality of goofing around with something that has serious consequences. The marriage bond is indissoluble, which means that it cannot be undone by anyone for any reason except death. This is to protect the stability of the family. It gives stability to the marital union when one spouse knows that the other spouse will never leave them. It also gives stability and comfort to the child who knows that mom and dad will never leave him. Our Lord in the Gospel of St. Matthew said the following when he was educating the apostles or his disciples on marriage. He said, Therefore now they are not two, but of one flesh. But therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. The Council of Trent declared that the bond of marriage cannot be loosed on account of heresy or of difficulties in living together or of absence with evil intent to one marriage partner. And the Church does not err when she has taught and teaches that according to evangelic and apostolic doctrine, the bond of matrimony cannot be dissolved on account of adultery of one of the parties. Even those who are not baptized and who exchange vows are validly married. And although there is no sacrament, their marriage is still intrinsically indissoluble. But Father, these are serious terms to this contract. That's right. It's because it is something serious. It is not a prop on a movie soundstage, but we know that even that can kill you. The terms of marriage, of the marriage contract say, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. It is a vow to the death. It's that serious. This is why our Lord's teaching on marriage in the Gospel of St. Matthew to the disciples. The disciples turned to him and said, If the case of a man with his wife be so, it is not expedient to marry. Our Lord had just taught them how serious this marriage contract is and the disciples clearly understood it. Since all sacraments have matter and form, marriage is no different. But this is all pretty simple since the man and woman entering the marriage are both the ministers and the recipients of this sacrament, and it pertains to their life together. We recall from last time that matter is the stuff of the sacrament, and the form is the words that express the reality of the sacrament. 
So the matter is the handing over the contract of one spouse to the other spouse, a baptized person making a vow to the future spouse. The form is the acceptance of the vows by the other. When these are done, the marriage is ratified. In the Latin rite, the priest is just the representative of the church to ensure its validity as a true marriage and as a sacrament and to bless this union. The man and the woman administer this sacrament to each other. They are the ministers and not the priest. For the valid reception of the sacrament of matrimony, the fall will have to happen. The both persons exchanging vows have to be baptized. They have to have also at least the intention to do what the church intends, that is to contract an indissoluble Christian marriage. They have to exchange these vows in the presence of a priest and two witnesses. The maid of honor and the best man are the witnesses to this contract. The priest confirms the consent of marriage and blesses the marriage. He is the official witness for the church, and he provides the ceremonies for the sacrament. Now, if the spouses marry each other, why can't a Latin Rite Catholic couple get married without a priest? Good question. All baptized Catholics are subject to canon law by virtue of being Catholic. That's the church's authority. Canon 1108 says, Only those marriages are valid which are contracted in the presence of the local ordinary, that's the bishop of the place, or parish priest, or of the priest or deacon delegated by either of them, who in the presence of two witnesses assist in accordance with the canons pertained in the form of marriage. So for a valid marriage... It has to be done by a local bishop or parish priest or a priest or deacon delegated by the local bishop or pastor. And there has to be two witnesses. Otherwise, the marriage is not valid. We have to remember the sacraments are all about sanctifying grace and about getting ourselves to heaven. The sacrament of matrimony gives an increase of sanctifying grace on the couple who has just exchanged vows to help them live more holy lives and to give them supernatural strength for the fulfillment of their duties of their state, provided, of course, that they are in the state of sanctifying grace when they are married. But this is only for those who have received the sacrament. We recall that the non-baptized can be validly married, but it is not a sacrament, since the sacraments are only for the baptized. If a marriage is invalid, there are no sacramental graces there either, since there is no marriage. The married couple also receives the actual graces which the husband and wife will receive as often as they require it for the fulfillment of their duties of their station. They'll get the graces to be faithful to each other throughout life. So let's do a quick review. Marriage is a serious contract made before God which protects the creative power of the marital act. The primary purpose of marriage is the procreation and the education of the children. The secondary purpose of marriage is mutual help and comfort and remedy for the concupiscence. Any reasonable request for the marital debt cannot be refused without the guilt of serious sin. The marital bond is indissoluble and cannot be undone by anyone. The sacrament of matrimony gives an increase of sanctifying grace to help the married couple live holy lives and strengthen them in their vocation. And sanctifying grace is necessary for salvation. Those receiving this sacrament also receive the actual graces necessary for their duties throughout their station in life. This sacrament gives the graces to be faithful to each other throughout life. The sacrament of matrimony is the institution which God gave to man and woman the physical power to cooperate in creating human life. This creative power is a tremendous responsibility. Abusing this power outside of how God intended it is like a Hollywood stunt of taking a prop of a 44 Magnum, putting it to your head, pulling the trigger, and having the wadding from the black cartridge shatter the life of sanctifying grace in your soul.